Good morning, church. If it's your first time here, welcome. Glad you're here. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. Uh, it's going to be a good day. It, it already has been a good day, and I'm looking forward to experiencing God through his word together. If you have a Bible, let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible and you need one either to borrow or to have or to keep, we have some in the back. If you raise your hand, an usher can, can bring you one. Again, if you don't have one, you can keep it. John chapter 6. You know what? We'll start in verse 61. I'll just paraphrase the, the rest of that. So to give you some context, what's happening is Jesus is in the midst of his, his ministry, and he's become a local celebrity. He's healing people. He's teaching. And as you can imagine from, you know, 2,000 plus years ago where there's no TV, there's no social media, seeing someone be healed and seeing this man do these types of things would cause a big uproar, a big crowds of people. And so sort of at the height of his ministry, he has 5,000 people, 5,000 men, which means 10 to 15,000 people. He's teaching them and they get hungry. And so he decides to feed them. He takes a couple of loaves of fish and a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. He multiplies it and he feeds 15,000 people with this. So you can imagine this is like the height of his popularity. He is dearly loved by the crowds. But what's interesting to me is that Jesus never really seemed to be hungry for attention. People were always loving him and coming after him, but he never really seemed like phased by it. In fact, he almost seemed to intentionally do stuff to not push people away, but to sort of weed out the crowds, so to speak. And after he feeds the 5,000, he does that very thing. He gives them some teaching. And he says, look, you guys aren't really following me for the right reasons. You're following me because you, you got a meal. So the people get a little of, offended by this. And this is where we pick up verse 61. Aware that his disciples, which means the people who are following him, that they were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. And from this time, many of his disciples or his followers turned and no longer followed him. Come back to that in a moment. Who of you likes physical pain? Raise your hand. Nobody likes physical pain. All right, so I got bad news then. You're going to experience some physical pain in your life. No matter how hard you try to avoid, you're going to experience some physical pain. No matter how hard you try, you are eventually going to hit your pinky toe on the edge of furniture. It's just going to happen. If you're a parent, no matter how hard you try, you are eventually going to step on a Lego in the middle of the night. Doesn't even matter if you don't have Legos in your house. Somehow, somehow, you're going to step on a Lego if you're a real parent. It's just, this is how that goes, right? The thing with physical pain, though, physical pain... The nice thing about it is that it tends to come and then it usually it, it goes. There are some whose physical pain lingers. But I'm talking about in general, you stub your toe, you step on that Lego, it comes and it goes. Emotional pain is a little different. Right? Emotional pain tends to linger. It tends to stay with you. It, it, it transcends your body and touches down to the soul. Sometimes I can consider it soul pain because it... it, it touches your, your inner being, so to speak. And when you talk about emotional pain, there's different forms of emotional pain that we might experience. For example, disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed? Right? This, it's very disappointing to be disappointed. It's this feeling of deflation, like the wind's been let out of your sails, you're, you're super let down. Disappointment's a very uncomfortable feeling. Grief is another one. If you've ever lost a loved one, or lost something that meant a lot to you, you experience this deep feeling of 
sadness and loss. It can take years sometimes to sort of get your grief under control. There's a lot of emotional pain that we will experience in this life. But arguably the greatest form of emotional pain, or at least one of the top forms of emotional pain that we can experience is rejection. The pain of rejection hurts deep. In fact, it's so deep that I think the fear of rejection is what really provokes much of human behavior, whether you realize it or not. It's the fear of rejection that prevents many of us from putting ourselves out there with other people. It's the fear of rejection that prevents many of us from pursuing deep, intimate relationships that we actually need. Even when you talk about sharing your faith, a lot of times we think, oh, I'm too shy, or I don't know enough. That could be true, but oftentimes it's the fear of rejection that's actually preventing us from sharing our faith. It's a very, very painful, painful thing. And you ask the question, why? Why are we so afraid of rejection? What is it? And I think it has to do with how God made us personally. When God made humans, he made us as, I'd say, very needy creatures. So we are not self-sufficient. No matter how much you think you are, you are not self-sufficient. You have needs that cannot be met within yourself. You have needs that must be met outside of yourself. And if those needs are not met, you will not thrive and you will eventually die. That's just how God made you. For example, food. Food is not something that you just want. You actually need food. And if your body doesn't have food, what will happen is your body will lack energy, it will not thrive the way it should, and eventually you'll end up dying if you don't get that food. Same thing with sleep, same thing with water, same thing with oxygen. Your physical body has needs, and if they're not met, you won't thrive and you'll eventually die. And the same is true of your soul, believe it or not. Your soul, the immaterial part that is really you, the spiritual being that's contained within this physical body, that your, your soul has, has needs. And if your soul's needs aren't met, you will not thrive. You'll become broken. Or you'll, you'll become dysfunctional. And central to the soul is the need to feel and be loved. Everyone needs love and wants to feel loved. Everyone wants to be important. Everyone. Now, for, for, for some, you may think, ah, that's, that's if, if you're a man or if you value toughness and you value uh, strength, you may be thinking, ah, that's, that's for, for weak people. But I want to, uh, let me use some different terms that might register with you. Everyone wants to feel significant. Everyone wants to feel important. Everyone wants to feel like they matter. Everyone wants to feel valued. Everyone wants to be respected. Everyone wants to feel like they're worthy of love, worthy of attention, worthy of affirmation. This is what the concept of, of self-esteem is really built on. Sometimes we think self-esteem is, ah, whatever, and, and, and it can get taken too far, but self-esteem is actually real. Everyone wants to feel confident in who they are, feel secure in who they are, feel like they're worthy of love and worthy of affirmation. Everyone wants that, and I believe that that's why rejection hurts so deeply. It touches on something that our our soul needs. It's a threat to our value. It's a threat to our, our significance. Because when you're rejected and it hurts deeply, what's happening is you're telling yourself or you're hearing, you're experiencing, you're not worthy of love. You're not good enough. You're not worthy of the thing your soul needs most, love, significance, importance. And when we feel this rejection, the person rejecting us might not even be saying that or might not even be intending that, but that's how we are interpreting it. And the pain of rejection can go so deep, it leads to a lot of dysfunction. The pain of rejection leads to alcoholism in many people. It leads to sexual dysfunction. The pain of rejection can lead to, to unhealthy relationships because it hurts that deeply. It's interesting. But what's... what's I think incredible to me, if, if you just realize in the scriptures that Jesus was just rejected. Did you catch that? Go back to verse 66, if you don't mind. So get again. It said, from this time, many of his followers turned back 
and no longer followed him. Rejection. And if you look throughout the life of Christ, what you'll find is that Jesus was rejected all of the time. Over and over again, this man dealt with tons of rejection. Write down Luke 4, verse 28. Luke 4, 28 and 29. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. It says, the, now Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, giving a sermon. It says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. That's rejection. <laughs> that. Not only do we not like you, we want you dead. This world would be a better place if you were no longer living. That's the kind of rejection Jesus faced. Let's keep going. Look at Matthew 13. Or write down Matthew 13, verse 53. Talking about rejection. Matthew 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Once again, he's giving a sermon. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Jesus' homeboys, the people he grew up with, his neighborhood, rejected him, took offense at him. Rejection. Write down John 7, 1 to 5. John 7, 1 to 5. It says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go into Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public figure, acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Jesus' household, the people who knew him most, who he grew up with him, rejected him. His 12 disciples who he poured into for three years, 24 hours a day, rejected him. When he was on the cross, he went to the cross by himself. Every one of his disciples deserted him. Take it a step further. His right-hand man, his boy, Peter, the one who said, I'll be with you even if everybody else falls away, the one who was his biggest advocate, denied ever knowing Jesus so adamantly that he called down curses upon himself and Jesus witnessed all of it. He was right there looking at Peter as he said, I don't even know Jesus. Jesus was a man deeply acquainted with rejection. But what's incredible, it didn't seem to phase him at all. If you, if you read the Gospels, he's not wrecked by any of it. You don't see him becoming an alcoholic. Or you don't see him uh, chasing around dysfunctional women. He's not passive in his ministry. He doesn't give up. He just goes about his business emotionally and spiritually and mentally healthy and whole. Why is that? And it's not just because he was God. Yeah, I think we can, it can be a cop-out. He was fully man as well. So why was he able to live with so much rejection and yet it not completely wreck him? And imagine, imagine if you live like that. Imagine if you lived unafraid of rejection, unwrecked by rejection, what would your life look like? How much more risks would you take? What would you be? What would you become if you weren't afraid of being rejected? Huh. I have a thought on why Jesus was not wrecked by rejection. It's in Matthew chapter 3, which is in your bulletin, so let's go to that. Matthew 3. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee 
to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill our righteousness. And then John consented. Verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. In this moment, God the Father is affirming Jesus' identity. So God is saying, this is who this man is. And as God the Father affirmed the identity of the Son, he also affirmed how he felt about the Son, how he was connected to the Son. He said, this is my Son. He belongs to me. We're connected, and I love him, and I'm well pleased in him. And I believe that this is why Jesus was not wrecked by the rejection of man. He had soul needs, just like every other human ever existing has soul needs. But his soul needs, his need for love, was found in the love of his father. That is why he was not wrecked by the rejection of people. The father loved the son. The father was pleased in the son. And that connection, that relationship with the father is what his soul needs were, were found in. So he wasn't desperate for the love of man because he was secure in the love of the father. You might even say he was secure in his identity. And I think this tends to be the difference between us and Jesus when it comes to rejection and when it comes to the affirmation of people. We tend to be deathly afraid of rejection, afraid to be vulnerable, and feel feelings of deep insecurity because we seek to have our soul needs met in things that are not meant to meet our soul needs. We, we, we seek to attach our worth, attach our value, attach our self-esteem, attach our confidence, attach our importance to lesser things, things less glorious, things less valuable, things less significant, things less satisfying, things less worthy, and we end up broken and dysfunctional and unhealthy because we've attached ourselves. we're seeking to have our needs met and things that can't meet those needs. And so what I wanna to do today is, is sort of look at some of the things we tend to attach our self-worth to or attach our self-esteem to or attach our confidence to because if we're unaware of these things, we're going to be dysfunctional in the long run. I'll give you a few quick ones right now. Positions. Oftentimes, we attach our worth to a position. So here's the line of thinking. I'm significant. I matter. I'm important. I'm secure in myself because I hold this position. I'm the lead pastor of this church, and that's what makes me significant. I'm the president of this organization, and that's what makes me significant. I'm on the board of this nonprofit, and that's what makes me significant. I'm the director. I'm the manager. I'm in charge, and that position is what makes me feel valuable about myself. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is you're not always going to hold that position. And when that position is removed, so is your self-confidence, and so is your self-worth, and so is your identity. Here's another one. Possessions. We tend to place our self-esteem or our self-worth in possessions. I have a house that's this big, and that's why I'm important. I make this much money, and that's what makes me important. I live in this neighborhood. I drive this car. The things that I have or what make me significant and important and valuable. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is what happens when you don't have it anymore. There goes your self-confidence. There goes your self-esteem. There goes your self-worth. Here's another one. It's usually attached to, posi to, to position is power. Power is what makes me significant. Power is why I'm valuable. Power is why I'm worthy. Here's another one. Performance. I'm important because of what I can do. I get good grades, 
and that's where my value lies. I'm really good at sports, and that's where my value lies. I'm really good at music. I'm really good at pleasing people. My value, my significance, the reassurance that I matter is connected to my performance, my ability to do. All of these things are faulty connections that we form. We're connecting our significance, our value, our worthiness to lesser things. And the one that I want to drill down deep on today is people. We tend to connect our value, connect our self-esteem to people. I'm important. I'm significant. I'm worthy of love because of the people around me. Friends, this is not God's plan for his children. It just isn't. We are not to get our value, our esteem, our significance from people. And there's three ways in which we tend to do this. I've realized it in myself, and I've seen it in those around me on how we tend to attach our value and our significance and our esteem to the people around us. The first one is through competition. Yes, competition. What do I mean by that? I'm significant, I'm valuable, I'm worthy because somehow I'm better than you. Somehow I'm able to be more than you. Somehow I'm able to do more than you. And that is where my significance lies. I feel good about myself because I'm prettier than most people. I feel significant about myself because my biceps are bigger. I feel significant about myself because I'm smarter. I've achieved more. I, my worth, my value is connected to being more than you. And I appear to be confident, and I appear to be secure, but I'm deeply insecure. And I live my life in constant competition with the people around me because my identity is centered on it. And if I'm not better than those around me, I don't feel good about myself. Seems like not a big deal. It's a very big deal. And by the way, it's hard not to succumb to this. You live in a competitive culture. Com competition drives everything. You compete for jobs. You compete to get into college. You compete for spouses. You compete for homes. You compete in everything. And it's hard not to attach your worth to competition when you live like that. Your whole society is largely built on comparison. Think about winning. Winning is really in comparison to someone else. I've scored more points in comparison to you. That's, that's what our society is built on. And there's good things that come from that, right? Work ethic comes from it. Uh, doing a good job comes from it. All good things, but also there's some negative things that can stem from it. And one of the negatives is constantly comparing yourself to the people around you and trying to be more. And that is something that many of us deal with. I feel good about myself because I am better than you. And that's not the mindset that God wants his children to have. Write down Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4. I want to encourage you today to really consider what's being said. Don't just check out. Not somebody else. Just consider, might you have some of this in you? Not for condemnation, but for liberation. You've got to first identify it before you can be set free from it. It says, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What are you supposed to do out of, vain, uh, out of uh, selfish ambition as a Christian? Nothing. Everyone say nothing. 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 When you live your life in constant competition with the people around you, that is the epitome of selfish ambition. Your whole life is centered on trying to be better and more than those around you. And sure, you may do good things and do kind things to people from here and there, but the mindset that finds its value in being more than other people is a stretch from what it looks like to think like a child of God. God's children don't find their value in being more than other people. They find their value in their father. They find their value in their identity. They find their value in their creator. Now, is it sinful to be competitive? Is it wrong to feel good when you win? Well, it all depends. It depends on what you're getting from that. How do you know if it's unhealthy and it's broken and it's dysfunctional? We'll talk about that a little bit later. 
But for the first way in which I see that we link our self-esteem to the wrong things is, is by being better than people. Here's the second way. It's similar. It's not that I'm better than you, but it's that I'm equal to you. We tend to find our self-worth in being equal to you or equal to those around us. So I find my significance, I find my value not from God, but rather from meeting the standard that you have set or the standard that society has set. Keeping up with the status quo, that's where my significance and my importance and my self-confidence lies. You think this is uh, uh, not common? This drives so much of behavior in our society. This mindset is what drives peer pressure. Just so you know, if you look behind the psychology of peer pressure, it's this. By living up to this standard set, that's what's going to make me significant. Keeping up with the Joneses, as they say. Everybody know what that means? Right? What drives that? It's this, that my significance will come from keeping up and being equal to the standard. This is what trends are built on. Anytime you see the masses doing something, it's not just individual people making decisions. There's something going on. There's a, there's a psych psychology. There's a mindset underneath it that's driving it. And what drives trends, if you really look at the, the, the psychology behind it, there's this sense of belonging. There's this sense of significance that comes from you following the trend. So I remember like when, when years ago, women used to wear just normal jeans like on, on their hips. And all of a sudden one day I saw a woman with holes in her jeans. I thought, oh wow, maybe she got attacked by a dog or <laughs> she has holes. That wasn't a thing. But then after a while, oh, another woman had holes in her jeans. And then everyone had holes in their jeans. Now, how do all these women have holes in their jeans? And then it changed. Then it went from holes in the jeans to, I saw a woman with her jeans pulled up to here. It's like, huh, that woman, that woman's wearing her jeans past her belly button. What is, what is that? But then after a while, I saw another woman with her jeans pulled up to here. And then every woman had her jeans pulled up to here. And then the newest one, I saw a woman with her shirt tucked in, but it was just the front and the rest was out. I thought, seriously, I thought, that woman just accidentally tucked her shirt in. She doesn't even know it. But then I saw another woman with just the front of her shirt tucked in. I was like, huh. And then I was like, how are all these women accidentally tucking the front of their shirts in? Sounds funny. It's your, you know what's behind that? Just so you know. <laughs> right. the men, there's, a, there's a psychology underneath all that. I'm significant if I do this, if I conform to what this pattern is going. Same thing with the, with the Stanley Cups or whatever. There's this, there's this sense of belonging that comes. Now, and it's men have their things too. It was, it was good to wear mustaches, then mustaches were out, and then young people were wearing mustaches again, and then mullets came back. It's like, what? well, what's happening is there's this, there's this significance that's attached to it. Now, is it sinful or wrong or dysfunctional to follow the trends? or to do those things, I, again, it all, it, really, it all depends. What are you getting from it? Well, how do you know if it's dysfunctional or broken? Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But ways that I found myself and ways that I found others seek their significance in people is by being better than them, being equal to them. And here's a, a, a third way. I find my significance and my self-worth in what you think about me. I find my significance and my self-worth in what you say about me. My value, the reassurance that I matter is found in your words and is found in your thoughts. And I feel good about myself as long as you give me a steady dose of affirmation and validation and kind words because my self-esteem and my sense of self-worth is connected to what you think and what you say about me. And I live for the affirmation of other people. And my value is connected, and I can't take it if someone doesn't like me. 
And I make my decisions largely based on how people around me are going to think well of me. These are classic, classic symptoms of someone who finds their self-esteem, their self-worth, their self-significance in the words and opinions of the people around them. Now, again, why does this matter? Well, it, it matters because this is not what God has for his people. He doesn't want us enslaved to people. He wants us liberated so that we can love people and not have to worship them. I want to show you a picture of a, a visual picture of what this looks like when your esteem is attached to lesser things. Write down Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Are we there? Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. All right, so Jesus is finishing up his sermon on the mount, and he ends with this analogy. And the purpose of the analogy is talking about building your life upon him. It's, it's talking about having the right foundation. Now, the house that was built on the rock, the house that was built with the right foundation was secure. It didn't fall. But the house built on the sand, the house built with the wrong foundation was insecure and it fell. Apply that, that principle to our self-esteem, our self-worth. When we attach our significance to the wrong things, we will be insecure, and our self-significance will eventually crash when the, wrong, when, 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 the, when the storm comes, so to speak. Yeah, I may feel good about myself for the time being. Again, I may appear to be confident, but my confidence will only last as long as the conditions remain the same. But if things change, my confidence, my self-worth is going to come crashing down. So when I'm not the prettiest in the room anymore, or I'm not the best athlete anymore, or I'm not the smartest anymore, that confidence that I had is going to come tumbling down. And for those of us who had to be equal to others, yeah, I feel good about myself, but when I can no longer meet the status quo, when I can no longer follow the trends, when I, when I no longer have enough money to do what, I, what everyone else is doing, my confidence, my self-worth is going to come crashing down. And when my significance is found in what you say and think about me, we're all good until you don't think well of me anymore and until you're not giving me my validation and you're not affirming me and I'm not able to please everyone around me and someone's going to be mad at me, then my confidence and my self-worth is going to come crashing down because it was built with the wrong foundation. Children of God are not meant to find their security in people. They find their security in their heavenly Father. They find their security in their identity. He is who completes us, not people. And as long as we put our hope, we put our security in lesser things, whether it's people, whether it's positions, whether it's power, whether it's possessions, performance, we're going to be insecure at best, appearing to have it all together. But when that storm comes, and when those things are no longer there, we're going to come crashing down, and we don't know who we are anymore because we built our foundation on the wrong thing. Okay, so what are people's connection to us then? Like, how should you affect my self-worth? Is it okay to feel good when I beat you in a sport? Or is it okay to feel good if you give me affirmation? Or is it okay to, to, to like keeping up with the trends? Like I said earlier, it really all depends. What are you getting from it? What is that serve? What role is that serving in your life? 
That's what you really have to evaluate. And I use an analogy or a story to sort of highlight the, the picture. Okay, you got a guy and a girl, a man and a woman. They go out to dinner. Fine dining institution. So the waiter comes to the man and says, what would you like to eat? The man says, you know, I heard y'all got some good uh, steak seasoning. Let me get some of that steak seasoning. The waiter says, okay, cool. You want tri-tip or, or sirloin or ribeye? The man's like, nah, I don't want the steak. I just want the seasoning. Let me get some of that seasoning. The waiter says, okay, whatever. Comes to the woman. Says, uh, ma'am, what would you like? She says, you know, I heard you guys have an amazing balsamic vinaigrette salad dressing. Let me get some of that. I said, okay, well, what type of salad do you want? A house salad, garden salad, side salad? She said, oh, I don't want the salad. Just let me get the dressing. All right, so the waiter comes back, and he brings out the seasoning, steak seasoning, brings out the salad dressing, and the man and the woman both partake. And it tastes good, and they feel good, and they enjoy it. But the only problem is they're hungry 10 minutes later. Why are they hungry? Well, they're hungry because the thing that they partook in didn't have the substance needed to sustain them. The seasoning and the salad dressing was able to please them. It was able to tickle their fancy. It was able to make them feel good, but it didn't have the sustenance needed to sustain what their body really desired. If they really wanted to be full and be satisfied, they needed to have the steak. They needed to have the salad because the steak and the salad have the substance to sustain them. And when it comes to the affirmation of people, I think this is sort of a, a, a picture of what it is. You don't need seasoning or salad dressing. You need steak to sustain your body. You need salad to sustain your body. And you need God's affirmation to sustain your soul. You don't need people to sustain your soul. They can't sustain your soul. They can make you feel good. They can give you some pleasure. They can tickle your fancy, but they don't have the substance needed that your soul longs for. Only God has that. And so rather than replacing the seasoning with the steak, you add the seasoning to the steak. The seasoning was never meant to replace the steak. It was meant to reinforce the steak. The salad dressing was never meant to replace the salad. It was meant to reinforce the salad. And the affirmations of people that they give us, they're not meant to replace God's affirmation of us. It's meant to reinforce it. What God says about you is the foundation of your self-confidence. And people are the finishing touches. But oftentimes, we get that mixed up. We throw out what God says. We completely neglect what God says. And we just want the people. I just want you to affirm me. I just want to be better than you. I just want to be equal to you. And though that may work for a while, you are going to be desperately in need of more, always needing more affirmation, always trying to meet another standard, always having to be better than someone else because the form of affirmation that you're seeking can't satisfy your soul. Only the affirmation, only the love of the Father can satisfy what your wayward soul needs, and people reaffirm that. And that's what Christ had. He was secure. From what I see, he was secure in his identity. He was secure in the love of the Father, which made him able to love people the right way. And even when they rejected him, he was okay. He was okay because he was made whole, not in them, but in his Father. But there was one time when Jesus seemed to be a little, a little shaken up to the core. I want to look at that real quick. Write down Matthew 26. We'll close in a few moments with this. Matthew 26, 36. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Okay, so Jesus faced some pretty traumatic experiences, right? Being thrown off a cliff, pretty traumatic. But nothing seemed to shake him up like the preparation for the cross. So why? What was it about the cross 
that made Jesus so unsettled in his soul. And you can say, well, it was the pain of the crucifixion. Hard to debate that, right? Yes, he was about to go through some physical pain, no doubt about that. I think there was something else that had him shooken up, though. Let's look at it. Matthew 27, verse 45. This is when Jesus is on the cross. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Leme, and I can't pronounce that word, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I wonder, I believe, this is why the cross was hitting Jesus so hard in the garden. On the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's believed that in this moment, Jesus is bearing the wrath of God. So all of the sin, all of the judgment that was stored up for you and me, rightfully so, that sin deserves, in that moment, all of that is being poured upon Christ. And in this moment, as the father punishes the son, listen, he turned his face away from him. He deserted the son. It's hard to imagine this. But the father who has loved the son for all of eternity, who is so connected to the son that they're literally considered to be one, who affirmed the son's identity at his baptism. In this moment, the father abandoned the son. You might even say in this moment, the father rejected the son. And that is what had Jesus so discouraged in the garden. I don't think it was the physical pain. It was the idea that Jesus knew for all of eternity, he has been secure in the love of the father. And now he was going to be disconnected from that love. When the wrath of God was going to be poured upon him, he was going to be rejected. He was going to be cut off from the flow of love of the father. And that is what wrecked Jesus to the core. That he'd be cut off from the love of the father. That's what was so painful for him. But as we prepare to close, what, the pain that Jesus endured from being cut off from the Father wasn't for no reason. It actually achieved something for us. And we'll end with this. Go to Romans chapter 8. Or write it down. Romans 8, you can write down verse 32. It says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Verse 35, listen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, we for, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered to be sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I am believing, I, I have said it in my mind, he's saying. There is neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know if you caught that. The Son was cut off from the love of the Father so that we might never be cut off from the love of the Father. This is the gospel. That is the gospel. That God so loved the world that he rejected his son so that whoever would believe in him might have eternal life and never be cut off from the love of the Father. Not pain, not hardship, not even your sin. You know better. You shouldn't have done that sin, yet even that won't separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's something to celebrate. That is something to give praise and glory to God over. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, I want to encourage you 
to really take what has been said and really f- reflect upon it this week. Don't just check out and consider it was a good, oh, that was a good sermon. And, uh, no. This has the ability, I think, to unearth some real stuff within us. As I've reflected upon my life and reflected upon this, so much of my life made sense when I started to realize, oh, my significance was actually placed in that. It didn't just make me feel good. My identity was in that. That wasn't good. There's, there's some real healing that can, can come from this. I want to encourage you. Reflect upon this week. What do you really place your significance in? For real. What is your self-esteem actually built on? Is it positions? Do you feel good because you're on the board? Do you feel good because you're in charge? Is that what your significance is in? Is it your possessions? Do you feel good because of how much money you have or because of the car you have? Or, or, or do you feel good about your performance? You're able to do things and that's why you feel secure in who you are? Is it power? Is it people? Do you feel secure because of what people say about you? Your ability to please them? Your ability to be better than them? Your ability to live up to the status quo? Really ask God, I challenge you, ask God, God, please reveal to me what my significance is really rooted in. And as God reveals that to you, the next prayer is, God, please help me surrender that. I don't want to be enslaved to that. that that's slavery. That's insecurity. God, I want, to, I want to find my significance in you. And I can't do that on my own, but by your grace, I can. Help me, God. I want to be whole. I want to be secure. I don't, I don't want to be wrecked by what people think about me. Ask God to reveal these things, and then may he give us his grace to, to change and be whole like Christ was whole. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's your soul work for this week. Let's pray. Lord, in this moment, Father, I want to pause. Would you start to do the work now? In this next 20 seconds, would you please start to unearth in us bring to our attention lesser things that we have put our significance in. Father, as you give us revelation this week, Would you please protect our hearts and minds from shame, from condemnation? It's not what this is about. This is about wholeness, being made whole in Christ. But in order to do that, we got to first identify what the problem is. Please unearth, unearth what our esteem, our worth is attached to. And then please give us the grace to attach it to the only one who can satisfy, which is you. All of us have a ways to go on this. And so would you please help all of us to to grow? We want to be made whole. Please make us whole, God. And thank you for being able. You are able to make us whole. May we believe that. It's Christ's name we pray. Everybody say together. Amen. 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 Again, soul work. Really... Really focus on that this week, not for condemnation, but for for liberation. Lord, is there anything that I'm putting my identity in? Help me surrender that and place it in my only firm foundation, which is is you. If you're new, again, welcome. Stop by the Welcome Center. We'd love to say hi to you. We have a small gift for you. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be here. They'd love to encourage you and pray with you. Do the soul work. Keep showing up to church, and let's keep growing in God's grace together. Amen? All right, God bless you. See you next week.